Good evening. Bonsoir. Uh, schönen Abend. Es ist mein, uh, no, c'est mon, it's my big pleasure and my big honor to say hello to you and to host you here at the Luma Westbau, which our stadt president knows from years ago. I think it's in 2009 when we opened here or a little earlier even, I should have researched better. And uh, to say hello also to Laurie. Is Laurie here? Yes. No? Hi, Laurie. It's Maya. Hi, Maya. Hi. And uh, I, th I think it's a great, yeah, wonderful, <laughs> great. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you, Laurie. Yeah. So um, I'm very um, happy also about this, um, this few days that are organized by Charlotte and I think uh, Daniel Baumann from Kunsthalle uh, Zurich will also say a few words to uh, welcome you here. So uh, Jacqueline Burkhardt will take over after that. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Laurie. Hope to see you soon. We cannot come to see you right now, but uh, it's wonderful to be with you. Enjoy, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, that's the last talk of, um, of this day. It has been an amazing day. This is obviously the firework at the end of this incredible day. And I, I would like to uh, thank all the participants uh, who were here, everybody who made this uh, day uh, the day it was. Uh, a really beautiful day. I would like to thank uh, the city of Zurich and our beloved mayor, Corinne Mauch, Luma Vespa, Maya, thank you for everything you do for us. It's uh, really essential, urgent, and beautiful. And also uh, the uh, bank Mirabeau, who sponsors us and uh, make all this possible. I was asked to introduce uh, Jacqueline Burkhardt, who sits here. Uh, I mean, how can you introduce Jacqueline? She's the, the most amazing being. She's inspiring. She's smart. She's sharp. You can pick a fight with her. It's like, <laughs> you, it's, it's, we all want to be like you one day, Jacqueline. <laughs> So thank you very much. You made, it's Jacqueline who actually made this possible. It was her idea. I didn't believe it could be possible. It is possible. So please give a big warm applause to Jacqueline, Corinne and Laurie. And thank you for coming. So also from my side, a very, very, very warm welcome first to Laurie, we are here at the Schwarzes Café, which is the Luma's space in the Löwenbräu areal, and it's uh, the Zurich Arc Weekend that uh, hosts this whole program. Uh, we are extremely grateful, uh, Laurie, that, and proud evidently also, that you accepted this invitation to talk to Corinne Mauch, our mayor of the city of Zurich. It is such a pleasure to hear you and to hear your thoughts and to have you here larger than life also, <laughs> so, uh, as you are <laughs> in Long Island now and it's an early afternoon. Um, so thank you uh, for giving us generously your time. And now I want actually from my side also to welcome Cori Mao, who has immediately accepted uh, uh, that should you talk together with uh, Laurie Anderson. And you told me right away how much you love her art. And uh, you have actually, with millions others, but you have a biographical relations to the States as you were born in Iowa and Laurie is from Illinois, <laughs> so you are neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you lived in two phases in, uh, in the States and in a total of about five years, that, uh, as far as I know. So, Corinne, you just rushed over from the station, from the bicycle, you were in Bern, and you had um, a meeting which is about the next national um, exhibition 
uh, which will take place in five different locations, no, uh, 12. More, more, more. Even more, so <laughs> many different locations. And um, uh, you know that Laurie was involved in the exhibition, national exhibition in 2002, the Expo 02. She then did a huge projection on a ceiling with 1,000 square meters, that means twice the 16 chapel, uh, the Michelangelo ceiling, huge, and also an ambient sound which lasted for six months, which was fascinating through all that, that whole time, without tiring every, anyone. And uh, the theme of that pavilion at the, then was who am I, wer bin ich? And um, uh, it was built by the architects Isa Sturm and Urs Wolf. And I also had the honor to curate this project, co-curate. So here, Corinne, this is the question. It is planned, uh, is it planned in the new edition of the national exhibition that artists will collaborate like Laurie Anderson or like Pippi Lotti Rist, who was so important in the planning phase of the Expo Zero Two, being the artistic director. Is there some ideas about this too? Yes, very much. Uh, I have, I'm very happy that you're mentioning this project because it really is uh, something very special which also excites me a lot because it's not a, a project of a national exhibition invented by some marketing people or some architects. Um, who think, ah, we have to do a national exhibition, but it was coming some sort of bottom-up from a group of the ten largest cities in Switzerland. Well, I think Lori knows that Switzerland is not so large, but uh, we have the largest cities together. They launched this project, and if you say, if you mention this project Lori had in the exhibition 02, uh, you said the question was, who am I? Yeah. I would say the question of our project is, who are we? Who are we as a, as a society, as a community also? And also because it's a, it's a, a very different concept. Well, zero 02 was a bit different than earlier ones. It was some sort of decentralized on three, three or four, four places, four, four places. places. Yes. But our project wants to cover the entire of Switzerland, from Geneva to Sangal, from Basel to, to Ticino to the Italian part. And we also have now members which join us in this project from all over the four parts, language parts of Switzerland. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, constructed as a sort of a movement. We want to become larger and larger, have more and more people involved until we have this some sort of accumulation in 2028. And the genuine idea was that it should be an artistic approach, an artistic project, um, giving some answers to the question, how do we want to live together in the 21st century in, a, in, a, in this country, which is very rapidly changing? That's most interesting. Um, Exactly a um, month ago at the Theater Spectacle, Laurie, you had um, a one hour radio uh, transmission called Night Picnic. We were all lying uh, on, on blankets on the Landi Wies listening to you. And you uh, said um, there that uh, your country now is in, deep, in a deep dream state unable to settle real and unreal. And you raised the question, do countries dream? Can you talk about this question, as it might be of great interest when a country like ours now plans a new national exhibition, which means it draws kind of a self-portrait? What a, first of all, thank you so much for asking me to be part of this conversation. It's pretty abstract to me. <laughs> I, I feel the, your, your presence, which is really great. I'm here on a sunny afternoon near the beach, so it's a very different world. Um, 
it's um, to answer your question, can countries dream? Absolutely. I think um, our, our own uh, cliche dream was one in which um, it's kind of a, it's a real cliche, the American dream, of, which is that everyone can rise up mm -hmm. to become basically a millionaire. That was the dream. Uh, and not to become, you know, a better citizen or whatever, but to be, that no matter how you were born, you would have a chance to um, succeed. And uh, it, not just in terms of money, but in terms of, of um, what you get to do here. So, uh, and that's, I, I would say that, that that's not an, uh, that has certain things to do with egalitarianism and also certain things to do with um, just ambition. Uh, is there a Swiss dream? I, did, I didn't understand. Is there a Swiss dream? There is a Swiss dream. Well, there, there are lots of Swiss dreams. But uh, we want to find out and um, what is the dream of the 21st century in Switzerland. And Jacqueline told me that you were very much in, uh, in favor of the Swiss flag. And interestingly, we are doing uh, some sort of questioning the, the people. We want that many, many people answer these questions on values, on positions, on their view, what is Switzerland, what is our society, what is their dream? And actually it bases on the Swiss flag. So we have this white cross. Uh, on the left, it is the I. On the right, it's the we, the us. And in the bottom, it's the here. And on the upper part, it's the there. And depending on how every person answers to these question, the flag, the cross, some sort of is torn apart, has a bit a different shape. Mm -hmm. Is maybe this way, maybe this way, mm -hmm. maybe shorter, maybe longer. Mm -hmm. And so actually each individual gets its own flag, but mm -hmm. in common it's still the flag, mm -hmm. the Swiss flag. Yeah. Because uh, I remember we, we were talking, Lori, about the Swiss flag and you said that you loved it because it is this blank, a uh, uh, pure white cross in the middle of a red uh, energetic field and it's square and it, you, you, you said that this is kind of a really symbol of a democratic, uh, of, of democracy finally and you, you really interpreted this flag so beautifully that I started to love it after being so fed up with it because it is... <laughs> It is ob ubiquitously omnipresent, uh, you know, front of every chalet and all that. Now, now <laughs> thanks to you, I, I, I can see uh, in this flag um, no more as, as this possessive national sign, but more a sign uh, uh, of a broader sense of identity and that. And now, uh, I know that you are extremely worrying about the, the situation now in the USA, and I wonder if you ever think, or, or how would you think that uh, uh, an American uh, flag, a flag of the United States, could look like? Could it be redesigned in, in t thinking of how to how to uh, realize a dream in a, in a symbol. <laughs> well, there have been a lot of American flags, and um, I, uh, I'm very interested. I, I'm working on some designs now, actually, that for some flags. Uh, first of all, uh, the Swiss flag is basically a perfect flag. It's so simple. Maybe the Japanese flag is also. Yeah. Yeah. I've always thought the American flag looked a little bit like, I don't know, pajamas, you know? The <laughs> it's so complicated, you know, it's a, it has a lot of symbols that are, uh, you know, the stars and the, the, the heavens and the earths. And, and um, so uh, the uh, flags that I think um, would... Uh, I, I'm just making red, red flag now. Uh, uh, what? Uh, I mean, most of the flags I'm making now are just different kinds of red. Red, uh, yeah. Um, 
It means distress, and, and they're made of different kinds of materials. Um, uh -huh. so, uh, they're, uh, they're not meant to be symbols right now. I, I'm uh -huh. not sure it's a time to try to sum up your uh, country in a symbol, but um, uh, it's something very much in my mind. It's just to show at the United Nations, there was maybe 80 different flags that people had um, designed. I found one maybe for um, uh, the, uh, uh, the desire to, um, uh, I can't remember now what it looked like. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. The flag down, for sure. Um, are some other, um, uh, do you have a favorite flag of, of the entire world that you've seen? I mean, because it's, it's, it's a tough thing to try to, yes. to, to graphically say uh, in just one rectangle um, so many things. I mean, the Swiss flag, of course, has the advantage of uh, also meaning uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, of help and, and help and health, you know, and uh, those are really amazing images. So, um, and it's not, and I think the Japanese flag is meant to represent the eternal rising sun, uh, which is a much more imperial way to, to look at things. But so, so I'd have to say my overall favorite is the Swiss flag. Um, but redesigning is, is a tough one. Yeah. You don't want to redesign your flag, do you? No. Temporarily. <laughs> Corinne, mm. uh, we know that you play bass guitar since ever in a band and that you love dancing and that finally culture is the most important for you. Um, as you are very busy and very engaged as a politician, how can poetry and art and maybe also playfulness infiltrate in your daily thoughts and actions? Well, first uh, of all, I am the Minister of Culture of the city of Zurich, so it's, it's my duty also to, to be responsible for, for cultural promotion in the city of Zurich, which I love very much. And in this context, of course, uh, you often, well, uh, dealing with art, um, reflecting art, uh, always, it, it very often is, is, is about something which is, is actual, which is present at the moment. And then I think it helps to maybe understand the past from a different point of view, mm -hmm. or have a different view on, on the present situation. I think it's mainly a question of, of openness and, and mm -hmm. of interest mm -hmm. into what art, art uh, speaking in art words, well, it's not words maybe sometimes, it's different, mm -hmm. but what, what it wants to tell us and how we receive it, how we perceive mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It changes it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and maybe I think I think art helps to look at one thing maybe with different eyes, mm -hmm. which is very important mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. because there is not I'm convinced there is not one truth, mm -hmm. not of anything. There are different views, and this is uh, talking of politics, uh, maybe very specific for the Swiss situation because we have mm -hmm. this. Um, uh, consensus principle in the in the governments. You have. I'm I'm not the boss of our government. We are nine people in the government, and I am one of those nine. I'm. Mm -hmm. I have to prepare the sessions. I have to lead the sessions, but I don't have more vote power mm -hmm. than my colleagues mm -hmm. have. So I have to convince. Mm -hmm. I have to ar argue. I have mm -hmm. to give good reasons yeah. why yeah. I see something the way I see it. You have to charm the cat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, they were not always cats. They're yeah. different yeah. animals sometimes. <laughs> I, I like this uh, idea of the truth. Um, and Laurie, in your book, uh, All the Things I Lost in the Flood, 
you write, you write that um, given the choice between something that is true and something that is beautiful, you would choose the beautiful. Because as an artist, you ultimately uh, trust more your senses than your rational mind. So, uh, Laurie, how is truth handled in the arts? Oh, well, in every single artist looks at that differently, of course. And uh, as you say, there's absolutely nothing um, that is ultimate about it. Because you can make something feel true that rationally is not true. So your mind says untrue, but you feel it to be true. So uh, we all have uh, many different responses to what's supposedly like that. And um, uh, there is a lot of conflict around those um, ideas uh, in the United States right now uh, in terms of, but, but that's a quite a different thing than uh, truthful artwork or untruthful something, because this is much more an argument about um, fact. And, and so we're uh, kind of living in a more medieval time now when, when what we know to be facts are disputed. And that, that's a different thing. Uh, so our issues of uh, so-called fake news, fake politics, are often issues of um, not not dispute of positions, but dispute of of um, what we call facts. You know, things verifiable things. Uh, so, for example, the planet is getting hotter. That's a fact that is um, completely denied by almost half this country. Meanwhile, three million uh, acres of the Northwest are burning today. Uh, three million is the size of the state of New Jersey. I'm not sure how that relates to the size of Switzerland, but um, it's like most of Switzerland would be ashes. So it's a, uh, it, um, so you have this fact that it's burning and you have, almost half the people saying that's not, uh, uh, it's burning because of the wind or something like this. You know, or just almost, uh, almost kind of uh, things that are, are uh, superstitious in a way, rather than facing the fact that we have a planet that's heating up and, and absolute, it is an absolute emergency to do something about it and not just pretend that that's not happen, happening. So there's, there are many levels of truth and, and those things are, are, for me, I'm very preoccupied with that level of truth, not so much with artistic truth because that's a much um, more complex uh, thing. I'm just done working on the level of, of um, fact versus, let's say, fiction. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's because you you were talking about truth, and Laurie, you you were talking on this picnic. You were uh, talking about stories, and I read somewhere that you said stories are at the heart of of everything you're you're doing. And in, in this picnic, you you mention you awake in the morning at four o'clock, and uh, you were you were afraid. You you have some images. You see some things you see burning parts of the country you see climate change you see migrating people suffering and you ask the question you said i don't know uh, is is it reality or is it just another story and i was astonished that you you mentioned this this word story in this some sort of negative context so story, it, it sounds to me, if you use it in this context, it sounds to me like, uh, uh, well, a story is, is fake, is invented. So what's, what's the relation between truth and stories for you? Oh, well, I would say in, in terms of politics, one of, our, one of the big shifts in American politics was a politician named Karl Rove who announced that the new reality is stories. 
it is no longer fact. And that was, was one of the key phrases of the early 20th century for us is this concept of if you can design a good story, that will pass as truth. So it was at that point that people in the government realized, whoa, we need to write some very good stories, plausible stories, exciting stories, stories that people like and, and can vote for. It doesn't need to relate to reality. It ha just has to be a good story. And what's a good story? Maybe one that scares you, but one that's quite vivid. And it, it's not just like, you know, things are working like this. No, it has a, an, often an element of fear or hope that's very, very strong that motivates the story that pushes, that's the engine of the story that makes it a good story. So it, um, it's not evaluated on the fact that it's true or not, uh, especially when it's used to convince people of the story of the moment. So we all do these stories. We all make them up and they're, and they're based more or less on, on our own perception, of course, and, and as much fact as we can bear. And um, so uh, language is, it works that way. And uh, it, it's a construction and it's a construction of reality, of course. So uh, the stories that are sold to us now are, are very much designed as um, to influence people and to tell them what the world is like right now, the 21st century story. Who's writing that story and what is, what is behind that, the motivation of that story. So you, you don't need to look for, for the writer. It's not usually Dostoevsky. You know, it is really you know, someone with a point of view and an agenda who needs to influence people in a way that makes them really believe in that story, not just think, oh, that's the person trying to run for an office or get a prize or something like this. But it's, it has to seem so real. So, uh, Exaggeration is, can be a big part of, of that, of course, so that um, the, the reason that the climate um, crisis is expressed um, it doesn't exist in one uh, for a large segment of this country is that they, they feel that the stories about that are so exaggerated, you know. So the stories of, of um, collapse are too exaggerated. How could that be happening? That's too exaggerated. Um, so I, I know that it's not too exaggerated. So, uh, I, um, when I look at, at things, I see, I do see them as stories. I do see on, on all sides as stories. Laurie, in one of your performances, you told us that once you asked John Cage where the things on our planet are getting better or worse. He replied, uh, much better, but it's just that we can't see it because it happens so slowly. <laughs> so what do you think about this now? Is the world still getting slowly better? Uh, actually, it's a question for both of you, <laughs> the perception. <laughs> Take it away. What do you think? I still think so. <laughs> I want to think this way. Uh, but I have to admit, I am a bit shocked about things that happened in the past years. Um, I, I always had this, this idea that uh, the progress, very important um, term, very important word, progress is something going forward, going into a good direction, going into the direction of freedom, going to the direction of, of more Aufklärung. And what is it? Aufklärung? Enlight Enlightenment. 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 Yeah. yeah. And what's happening now with election of so-called strong men, dictators in certain countries, war is going on, climate change is not really fought against. Uh, it makes it makes me doubt mm. if if this if this idea is still right. But in in the end, it, it motivates me to as a politician also to to not give up, to 
to still go into this direction and also to stand for, for, for this idea that progress, human progress, societal progress must go into the direct, direction of human rights, into the direction of uh, equality, into the direction of sustainability, uh, how we live on this planet. Um, because I think how we think about things also influences reality. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it relates a bit to what you were just telling about stories and how, how they can become a reality because people believe in those stories. And I, th I think uh, th having an idea of thinking something, believing also something, will, uh, will influence your, your acting and, and mm -hmm. will, will help going into, the, into a good direction. Mm -hmm. Even if it, if the signs are very hard, sometimes. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what? Laurie? <laughs> 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 slow is a key word here. Very slow, very slow. Because if you look at just evolution itself, um, it tends to towards complexity, and it is. Uh, and if you look at the evolution of of humans, uh, we came from nothing. We came from, you know, worms. And we are going in, in the direction of complexity. We're not sliding back down the evolutionary scale to become less and less complex and go back to our wormhood. We are not doing that. We are going another way, uh, back and forth all the time. But, um, and I'm not saying this to denigrate our ancestors who had the greatest concepts of freedom and truth of thousands and, and millions of years ago as well. The, from what we can tell of how they, they behaved, they behaved with a, with a, I would say, motivation, as you say, uh, towards progress with some idea of that. And that as we... Uh, go through the cycles of, for example, fascism, and that is what's going on in my own country, is, uh, is fascism. Uh, we, of course, question um, uh, the idea of progress. It's just, from my point of view, and from many people's points of view, the uh, opposite. However, um, uh, where are we going to go? Probably... Mars, when uh, we uh, when we deplete this planet, uh, which will happen maybe sooner than we think, uh, and um, th that's another uh, worrying thing because considering how well we take care of planets, we're thinking now we're going to take care of Mars. It's quite disturbing <laughs> what we would, might do once we get there. Anyway, I think it's important, as you say, to uh, uh, be absolutely optimistic. I don't think John Cage was absolutely optimistic at all. Not at all. When he said that it was to uh, encourage me in particular, because I was not having a very good time during that conversation, and neither was he. Here he is. He's a very old man. And what happened then was his lover of many years had just left him. Okay, so after a whole life of being with some person, your partner says, sorry, I fell in love with a nice young man and goodbye. So there he is, alone. And you're thinking, this must be the worst thing. You know, your, your love is gone and, you know, uh, you're... What is it, what do you have here? What kind of hope do you have here? So he said, and I can't even tour anymore. I'm too old. I can't pick up my suitcase. I said, I'll pick up your suitcase. I'll, I'll come along on tour with you and carry your suitcase. I mean, and he said, oh, okay. <laughs> so he actually died that, that year and I never got a chance to carry his suitcase. But um, I think it's very important to encourage other people. Uh, and and it's key, it's key to being human, to encourage each other, to try the, our very best to make amazing things, to make the very best things that we can uh, without knowing uh, 
the the future and and you know covid has been the greatest gift for for many of the people i know myself included because it kind of transformed the world into you know instant buddhists they you know people who have no idea what will happen none and no idea if you think you have an idea about what will happen basically you're an idiot you know <laughs> so uh it's it's this living with um uncertainty that is uh something that people are beginning to have some skill with and this is this is really a gift that i never thought i would see given what to the entire planet and you see different people responding to it in various ways you know some people think it's just the worst thing that, that has ever happened i can't make all my plans you know and then other people just feel like plans you know that's um as the joke goes plans are god's idea of a joke you know that's like funny <laughs> and so your plans uh, so uh it's made me uh, uh live much more in the present than i've been able to do in many many years and it's just uh, it's just the greatest thing how do you feel about about uh, i i i can also follow these thoughts and I have also uh, lived this feeling uh, mostly during lockdown when really everything was was shut down the, the restaurants were closed the stores were closed everything was closed and everybody disappeared into home office the ones who were able to it was really a very special situation I, I compared it to um, how you say Homsterrad <laughs> In English, ein Hamsterrad, a, ham yeah. a wheel where, wheel where where a hamster runs in the wheel in the yeah. wheel, and then suddenly it stopped. Yeah. So this, uh, for me, was something very positive, and I think many people um, perceived it as as also the positive aspects. But what what we experience now here, uh, or, or what I feel is. The, the longer it lasts, the, the more difficult it becomes because, well, we miss each other. We miss, we have to keep social distance, physical distance, uh, and, and, and it's becoming really difficult because we, we also want to be near, we want to, we want to feel the other people. We, we, are, we are social, social social um, human beings and and we're beginning to miss it more and more and what we are living is with these protesters against masks against measures to prevent uh, the the virus uh, spreading more and more uh, i i interpret it as people being hopefully um, not able to deal with it überfordert mm -hmm. and and if it's simply too much, mm -hmm. then you say it doesn't exist. It's, it doesn't exist, and, and the enemy is the one who says it exists, and you have mm -hmm. to wear a mask. Yeah. So I think this socially seen, this is a very delicate situation mm -hmm. we are in, and, 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 and we have to be careful that society doesn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. President uh, Macron said in a talk, that with Corona we are living wartime mm. and have uh, to fight against it. War. I wonder, Corinne, um, in what you, your terms are uh, uh, about Corona, given the fact that the virus doesn't know any front uh, borders or, or uh, any ideologies, how, how do you talk about Corona as a... Well, not certainly war. not war. Yes. It is not war. Yeah. Um, maybe even in the contrary. It's, it's something that, um, mostly in the beginning, but, but still um, uh, revealed, it revealed and profiled many things in society. It, it revealed very good things. It revealed bad things. And one of the good things it revealed was uh, this solidarity in the society, mm -hmm. people to went uh, mm -hmm. to, to um, buy food for for elderly people who weren't able to leave their their apartments, mm -hmm. uh, to help one another, um, and 
I, th I see it mostly in this direction. Of course, uh, we as managers of the city, the, the city council, uh, we actually, it was true and it was a new experience for me. We, we relied very much on military um, know-how, how do you manage a crisis, uh, how do you organize yourself to manage the crisis, how do you organize to have enough um, um, medical medical things you need to, to help in the hospitals, how do you um, prepare to have enough beds in the hospitals when, when you have to uh, be prepared that people who are sick or, or, or of corona will come into the hospital. There was a lot of military know-how, mm -hmm. and I have to say mm -hmm. it, I was, um, mm -hmm. it was a good experience. I was um, impressed yeah. sometimes yeah. how <laughs> you had this Führungsgrundgebiet 1, 2, 3, 4, and then, well, it worked, it worked. The, yeah. the, our, our, vital, our vital services were never in danger in the city of Zurich, yeah. and I also in, uh, think in, in the entire, in, in all Switzerland. Mm -hmm. But I would never um, um, name the, the, the situation we are in with this virus, as yeah. a society with the virus, as a war. Yeah. It's, we are challenged. I think we are very much challenged in our deep mm -hmm. human being or social being. Mm -hmm. Laurie, in your, in your um, uh, picnic, night picnic, you said this lovely story about the five-year-old boy who <laughs> thought a virus is now pirates and that there are, that the corona uh, pirates are around and that uh, now all us on the world uh, are wearing like armaments, uh, rüstung, our mask, and we all fight against the pirates, the corona pirates. Uh, um, on the same time, when you talked about uh, uh, corona, you talked sometimes about plague, plague, uh, which is a biblical term in a way, the plagues, the seven plagues. So, uh, how about that? Well, first of all, I, for, this is a five-year-old kid, and he needed, and he, he and he had, didn't know a virus. So, but he did know pirate, and it was inspiring him to, for him to have a way to think about it, because otherwise, it's just too bizarre. I agree that the metaphor of war is not so helpful. It, it began to be used in, by many people. Um, uh, a lot of American presidents used it. Susan Sontag used it too, you know, but she, she began to analyze, you know, what, it, what is this image of war, the war on cancer, the war on poverty, the war on education, the war, you know, it's like, um, uh, or the war on ignorance, actually, <laughs> which became the war on education. So uh, why use that term? And as, as you point out, uh, some of the uh, regimentation of a military approach can be very, very helpful when you get organized, uh, and, but not so helpful when you think of it as devastation. So when people looked out, I think, uh, and saw empty streets and thought, I feel like I'm looking at the war after, uh, after a neutron bomb that, le that leaves all the buildings but destroys all the people. And, and this image was very powerful for a lot of people until they realized, actually think of it as the, the most mobilized effort of people on the entire planet to help each other. This was unprecedented. This was unbelievable. So as, as you point out, people are so restless now. They just think, okay, I can't bear it. One other, we, as, and as you point out, we're social animals, social people, we need people, we, we need to go into a, a museum and see something beautiful, we need to go to a, a, a soccer game and get and root for our team, we need people, we need them, and so you just pretend it's not happening. It's our responsibility now to, to take what we learned about generosity and apply that to right now this, this restlessness and find devices, find ways to keep what's the best from that and to build it into our society. How do we do that? That's going to take a lot of brilliant people thinking of that because these are real problems when people say, I just can't stand to be in my house anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to kill my husband. You know, the people, relationships are breaking up. Families are breaking up. People are, are going nuts. They're going nuts. And so you have to listen to that 
uh, situation. I mean, not, not everybody likes to just sit in and go, this is great. I don't have to see anyone. We hermits. I'm a hermit, so I like it a lot. But I also like people. So I think, what ideas do you have that you could, let's say in Zurich, use to uh, take this, this sense of restlessness and, and, um, and, and frustration and turn it into something else? This would be this would be, I think, the the province of artists and thinkers and, and governors to come up with something that can accommodate this, the frustration and use that energy, because that's real energy. That's that's really powerful energy. And, and uh, so to harness that into a way, what do you think we, we could do? I mean, there, there might be some ways, because we've learned some very unbelievably valuable things. And yet now we need to do something with that. So everyone's kind of like, I don't know. what. So I think it's the most important problem right now, because this is not going to go away, even if there is a vaccine. Um, there, there's a question of distribution and, and effectiveness and all sorts of things. So we're, we're kind of stuck with this. And it's not going to be solved next week. And uh, we don't- If we lose it. I think the danger is if we if we lose it, if we just simply want to go back to normality, and and then everything is like it was before. This is the danger. What what, what maybe I, I my idea would be because I'm 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 totally on your side when you say it's real energy which is behind. I'm I'm sure it is real energy, and how can we? How can we help bring it into a direction which is positive for, for our society? And I think it, it only works through the way that you encourage the people uh, to, to, to see what were, their, what were good, uh, good approaches, good ideas, good actions that they had and encourage them to go on with them. Also, um, creativity, creativity, people have complete new ideas, ideas they wouldn't have had if they hadn't been this lockdown, if they hadn't been this COVID crisis, and encourage them, maybe help them, support them uh, to, to help realize or institutionalize maybe these ideas. Well, it's a, actually, it's a stupid example, but, but I can mention it. It just becomes, uh, comes to my head. We are, we're having this discussion in Zurich that also in winter, restaurants can be outside, have chairs outside, uh, have the space so that we can keep the social distance in the restaurants. Also in winter, in summer, it was a restaurant everywhere, tables everywhere. It was wonderful in the city, but now the winter comes. And they were asking that we allow them to put out their tables, put out their chairs on, 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 on any public space. And, and because it will be cold to have some sort of tent or have a roof on it and maybe heat it with this heating heights yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, mushrooms. And which, <laughs> which, are, um, which are not allowed in the city of Zurich because they just, uh, they, they produce CO2 and, and yeah. they depollute the, the, the they, they they promote climate change, and so we were we were discussing with with uh, these 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 people from restaurants from hotels uh, about what can we do, how can we prepare for the winter, and I said um, we are open for discussion, but don't come with this heating heating. It's not Idea. mushroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I speak to these heating installations, yeah. uh, but bring new ideas. And yeah. then one. Um, one man said, yes, uh, since this is publicly discussed, he had several uh, people contacted him, young startups, people have, having ideas that said, oh, we can offer you, we have an idea, how can we heat your tent outside, but completely CO2 neutral uh, with renewable energy. And, and so I think this is an, uh, an, an interesting point. Mm -hmm. People are creative, but we have to give them the opportunity to mm -hmm. realize and, and to encourage them also mm -hmm. to realize this, this creativity. Mm. Do, do you actively uh, 
try to creatively think of how in your government things could change or do you mm -hmm. react to what comes from the outside only? Have you, is it possible that you might now realize certain things uh, it's a good moment to change certain things with the great opportunity uh, without just having to react? Mm. Well, uh, when it began, first we were totally reacting to the yes. situation and we had to react very fast and very decisive and um, in, a, in a situation which is very unusual for us uh, of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. We didn't know if the decision we took was the right one and we, were, we ha have to be prepared that three days later we had to change the, mm -hmm. our decision because, because we knew three days later it was the wrong decision. So I think there we, we learned a lot. But now getting out of the, uh, well, when it began, we, we came out of the lockdown, we opened step by step. Um, there was also one big issue, what can we take with us? And one, one of the most discussed issues is home office. Home office was, well, difficult. No, it doesn't work in our uh, environment and yeah. public administration doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it simply, it had to work and mm -hmm. it worked. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to, to change also our regulations to, to so that people are are more able to, mm -hmm. to people from the administration will also in the future be able to do homework, to um, more easily bring together their, their family um, duties and, and their career duties. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of things that we really would like to take with us, mm -hmm. but you have, to, you have to organize it because, as I said before, the danger is simply falling back into the old track, being happy, oh great, it works just like before and then you forget all mm -hmm. You actually learn. I think, I think Laurie said that before. I experienced this very much that this 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 lockdown, this this quietness, mm -hmm. this stillness. It opened mm -hmm. the, the perception. Yeah, yeah. You saw so many things mm -hmm. that you normally don't see. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, it's uh, time runs, but I don't want to uh, stop before asking if someone of the public takes this great opportunity to ask questions either to Lori or to Corinne or to both. Is there a microphone around? There is a lady. Is there, so that we about know how many would ask, there is one question. Hi, uh, Hi. Laurie, I have a question for you. It's lovely to meet you. My name is Sabrina. Uh, so I studied uh, politics and aesthetics in the States. And my question is for you as an artist who is also clearly very thoughtful and has genuine concerns about our country. How, and when you were deciding what to create, do you separate sometimes things to make simply for the sake of beauty or for the sake of, of the delight of your audience and then do you separate it to just be simply to give a political message? Does that make sense, that question? It does. And for, I, I'm working right now this week on a, a local candidate here in Eastern Long Island who is running against a very powerful, uh, basically Trump candidate. And so we are, 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 and she is a scientist. She's running for office. And so, I am responsible for asking questions to her about how she sees um, things going. Now, one of the uh, um, questions I would ask her is has to do with um, uh, perception of uh, gun violence. So, um, and this has a roundabout way of answering your question. I'm I'm very surprised that. Doctors, for example, in the United States or anywhere really, um, after one of these mass shootings with these huge, um, extremely destructive guns that are now used uh, uh, and allowed, uh, why a doctor doesn't hold up a picture of what happens when you're hit with this kind of weapon. 
um, gun deaths in the United States is somehow pictured as, you know, the Wild West. A cowboy gets shot and then Doc, whoever comes up to the, you come to the second floor of the hotel and he goes, that must hurt. And he pulls the bullet out and spits it out and goes, put some bandage on, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Um, and people do not un actually understand uh, contemporary weapons because they aestheticize them. So it's the aestheticization of, of reality, you know, and the romanticization of, of, um, of weapons via the Wild West and, and stories. Okay, so I, my campaign with this particular candidate who is a scientist just is to say, why don't you encourage, for example, doctors to hold up this photograph and say, when this child was hit with this weapon, it pulverizes six major organs. It doesn't just go through the shoulder. It explodes that person. Uh, these weapons are allowed on the street now. Uh, I'm just gonna show you the consequences. So in other words, just showing people the, a simple truth like that, you know, is, is something that has become very, very politicized. And it works also, it, it appeals to uh, romantic stories that are, are propagated from, by writers about what it is to, um, in this case, be shot and, what have, and, and how romantic it is to have weapons. So, you know, that they're, they're glorified in, in all sorts of works of art. And uh, whether you think of weaponizing uh, the virus or, or, you know, however you, you look at that, it's, um, it would be best to just see um, in a very simple way uh, the consequences of, of our actions. It's the same with, with our, our fires here. You know, as I mentioned, the three million acres that have just burned. Um, the reality of seeing that, the reality of smelling that, the reality of climate change um, is abstract to people and it's, and, it's, um, and you'd really have to go to the Amazon to see the, what it means actually to look at, uh, and no one can see that except, you know, a cosmonaut from outer space looking down at the, at the basin and seeing that our oxygen is gone, you know, <laughs> so that, so I think that it's in some way, it's not an obligation of artists to fix the world, you know, any more than it's an obligation of a postman to fix the world or a politician to fix the world. We all have an obligation to do our best to um, uh, live here and, um, and to some extent try to make things better in our own ways, but it, often that's not a very coordinated effort. In, all I'm suggesting is that that it's important to uh, look at things without um, in in the very bright light of of uh, reality, which means that a lot of things aren't as as uh, beautiful as we thought. When you mention what to do with um, the reality of home offices and things like that. And what normal is, I would think that you in Switzerland have the greatest opportunity to create a new model for that because we in, in Midtown Manhattan, these gigantic office buildings, I mean, these are just, uh, you know, containers for hamster wheels, as you say, you know, they're just like real estate that is, is um, insane, that, that is part of the reason that, that the planet is overheating anyway. So to find an alternative to work to all these people getting to these big structures and what happens when they are even air condition their buildings on a summer day or the amount of energy that is being taken, uh, the home office starts to look like a rational response to a 21st century worker. So, um, and you have this opportunity to work in a different, on a different scale. You don't have to tear all these office buildings down. You could find another way to uh, make a working model that is um, that could, you know, show the world how it's done, you know, how a really eco-conscious culture can make this work, you know, and and you have, like you say, a lot of 
like we all do, have a lot of startups kind of like thinking these ways and they have to like really go into overtime now because we have this chance now. It's a very unique thing. We are seeing what, what it is to stop and what are we doing in this, in this moment? Yeah, it, it, it's the greatest opportunity to make a new model instead of, as you say, go back to that normal. That, was, that, was, that normal was extremely destructive behavior on everybody's part worldwide, you know, uh, and it and, and is completely global. As we see now, you know, with our elections coming up, who's deciding our elections? The Chinese and the Russians, you know, and and that even makes sense because they own this country. You know, our, 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 our debt is to the Chinese. So they figure like, we better, we better control what's going on because we own it. We have the bigger stake than somebody in Ohio who's just like renting a building from us. Okay, so the world is global, and uh, it's you can't fight. You can't. We that's what we made. We made that, and and we can't just pretend that we're in our own little countries now. We're not. So uh, I uh, I think that in places where you can think this thing through, and you're not, you know, it, it's not a, 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 a and it has a a, a um, a, a reasonable size to do it in, to, to, to do the social experiment, the social engineering. Uh, this, is, this is the most exciting moment to, to, to try. So I, I'm, um, I'm really encouraged in that, from that point of view, that people are thinking along these lines and, and, uh, and about to try to grab this, you know, try to grab this moment to, it's a very rare thing that that, that that hamster wheel stopped. I call it, I called it the merry-go-round. And it, but it is the same sort of thing that you're talking about, this circular stuff. I'm going to go and go and go, and I'm just going to do more of the stuff that I did, and get more and do more. And yeah, nah, 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 nah. For what? For who? You know, it's so destructive. It, it, it's where we are now. The world is burning. So now we have a chance to, like, you know, cool it down. It was a fantastic statement now, and we are so sad that we have to stop, that this talk is only an hour, and uh, it's now finished. And thank you so, so much <laughs> for uh, having given us this opportunity. Gloria, new coin, thank you so much. So um, thank you, thank you all for attending. I don't know if Laurie is still here with us and she, if she's seeing me, but um, despite what you said at the beginning, it felt like you were with us. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so this is closing the day now, like as a firework. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Moore, for being with us tonight. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for enabling this talk to happen and, uh, and um, giving us such an incredible evening. Thank um, you for giving us the opportunity. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> so we are very pleased uh, with Zurich Art Weekend to, uh, to be uh, enabled to, uh, to host these talks. Again, thanks to Luma and Maya Hoffman and, um, and the, the, the city of Zurich, the culture department, next to our sponsors. Um, tomorrow, I invite you to go in the, in the galleries, uh, go in the institutions, go in the venues, attend um, all the other events happening tomorrow. Um, there are talks, there are performances um, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and everyone in Zurich, the whole, uh, like the entire art community um, is uh, making itself available during this whole weekend to welcome you in very special conditions uh, by giving you their time and uh, um, uh, having um, made the effort to have uh, their artists with us in Zurich as much as they could um, despite the difficult situation. So thank you to all of you and um, see you tomorrow for like the last day of the Zurich Arts Weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Louis. Thank you.